Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director of All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. Tonight, we'll be talking about access needs in healthcare. We'll be hearing from a, a panel of community members discussing their experiences attempting to access healthcare. And as you'll hear, it doesn't go well often. Brain Club, of course, uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, this is our weekly community conversation about everyday brain life. Um, it's uh, We've been doing this for about a little over a year and a half now uh, for purposes of educating the community about neurodiversity and related topics of, of uh, inclusive community. This is not a support group. This is not for medical or mental health advice. Um, this is uh, for education purposes only. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club. As many of you have figured out, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to look at the camera or sit still or anything. So feel free to walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, like whatever, whatever needs doing. And everyone is welcome here at Brain Club and all formats of communication are welcome. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. There'll be a, about a, a 24 minute uh, video that we'll play shortly. Um, so during during that time, we'll have uh, only chat box going, um, but then we'll have plenty of time for discussion to follow if you'd like. Um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important to us to respect and protect the group's collective access needs and give everyone a chance to participate however they are most um, comfortable. Observation is a, is a completely valid form of participation, um, but um, uh, in order to give space for, you know, folks with a variety of, you know, a wide variety of communication access needs, want to just give space for um, folks to join in um, if they want to. So um, if, if you've shared out loud, um, maybe want to keep sharing in the chat to give, give space, give space for others. All right, so uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. And if not, try more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you'd like to turn them off. And that's my visual support to open the chat box so I'll actually see it if anybody would like to use it. And by the way, um, direct messaging is enabled. So if you'd like to, um, if, if you're uncomfortable for any reason, you, you can, you're welcome to send a, send a private chat message. Okay, so um, as I said, um, we're continuing our conversation about access needs. Um, so um, here we go. Before that though, I wanna recap why this matters. The status quo of neurodivergent health is not good. We know from the literature that there are extensive barriers to healthcare access. Darty et al. in a study of autistic adults um, found that barriers to healthcare cluster in these three buckets. One is, is environment related, so related to you know, interactions with the environment. The provider so autistic adults perceive um, widely that um, medical providers have insufficient knowledge and skills and unhelpful attitudes that interfere with the provision of healthcare. And lastly, the system. There are so many defaults in the healthcare system that are a mismatch for patients' needs. You must pick up the phone to make an appointment. You must fill out the 20 page packet to become a new patient. And remembering that, you know, anytime you have a default, anyone else, anyone whose brain does something different is othered. And so those defaults um, contribute greatly to barriers to access. And the healthcare culture, which starts really early um, there's a hidden curriculum for medical trainees, and I know many of you heard me share share this before. Like in my medical training, um, it was very common that you know a, a supervisor, usually a burnt out resident, would make some comment like, "Up, oh, there's a patient with a list." 
as though there were anything wrong with organizing your thoughts in writing. But this is what goes on, and patients feel it, and it's real. Knowledge um, in, in it also relates to failure to recognize um, uh, autistic people and help people provide, uh, you know, like help people acquire an, a lens to understand their lives. Um, and uh, what we know from Zerbo et al. in 2015, a uh, study out of Kaiser, less than 10% of primary care physicians would suspect their, pati their pa patient is autistic. If the patient volunteers information, shows interest in people, discusses emotions, and can see the whole picture, despite the latter literally being one of the key strengths of autistic cognitive systems. Anyway, so this is reflective of the stereotypes that are part of medical education and are barriers to access. And as we talked about a few weeks ago at our All the Things webinar, um, that there is a, often a widespread lack of knowledge about the physiology of autistic people. When you zoom way out and you think about how um, all of the, you know, many of the medical problems that are commonly experienced by autistic and ADHD adults, um, this is a whole body neuroimmune constellation. Hey, Lizzie, are you around that you can pop the link to the All The Things Project in the chat? Sure. Thank you. So our Everything's Connected to Everything project that Lizzie's going to link in the chat, um, it takes a look at the patterns of medical conditions commonly experienced by autistic and ADHD adults and almost all of the autistic and ADHD adults in our medical practice, for example, um, that the standard medical management actually doesn't, doesn't work for our community because all these medical conditions are intertwined. And when you fragment all the body parts and you frag, you treat these conditions as distinct and separate, as opposed to intertwined with the others, that often results in patients not getting better. And lastly, before uh, we, we listen to our panelists' experiences, um, last month, uh, we our theme was that of the double empathy problem. Double empathy problem is a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, an autistic social scientist in the UK. Um, that, uh, that, that Dr. Milton showed, and this has been reproduced many, many times, um, that it is the mismatch of communication styles and worldviews that results in miscommunication. Um, it's not that there's one set of normal communication skills and then there's autistic people over there um it's that it's it's both sides it's non-autistic people having a very difficult time perspective taking and uh, and misunderstanding autistic people and um uh as, as as we covered last month in our double empathy in healthcare brain club about the double empathy problem between healthcare providers and patients is also a huge barrier all right, and so um, with that, let's hear from our panel. Uh, you have to let me share screen, I think. Try and see if it works. Oh, uh, okay, now what do I do? Um, okay. I have no idea how to do this. Okay. So I pulled Thank it up. Thank you so much. You pulled it up. And then if you see the share screen mm -hmm. arrow thing, when you click it, there should be a little checkbox at the bottom that says share sound. It makes you select it. And okay. then you can. Oh, I see. I that. always, I just do like, I share my entire screen because I get confused, but you can, you're welcome to choose whatever you'd like to share. But how do I get the, how do I, I, so I shared sound. How do I get the, um, the video? Yeah. Did you, do you see the direct, the direct message with the yes, link I, in the chat? I clicked that. Yep. Cool. So if you just start playing YouTube, 
Oh, did I give you like a wrong link? Does that not go to a video? It goes to a video. It's trying to access help. But when I sorry, (laughs) everyone. Uh I hit share screen. I see the do I hit this desktop one? Yeah, yeah. Try that. You're doing great, Amy. You're doing amazing. The motor planning of share screen is absolutely the worst thing I do all day. Does anyone see it? Not yet. Do you have so two can I monitors? just tell I'll just gonna tell you what's happening on my end? So I hit yeah. share screen, a screen comes up and it says basic advanced file apps, and then it's like desktop whiteboard. There's no um how about the upper left corner? Does it just say screen? Is that a choice? It's under a- basic. Yeah. Under basic, no, it just says desktop one and there's an exclamation point. Hmm. How curious. Um, Mel, does the video no. pick up background sound or is it like, can you mute and have it on? I think you can mute and have it on. If I can, I'm happy to try it too while Amy's trying it too. I tend to oh. have these. Thank, Thank you. Tonight. I have the I have the video pulled up like on my Chrome web browser. But when I hit shared screen, it just it doesn't there's just like all these boxes. And it, and none of them say screen or video details or Google Chrome. One says Google Chrome, it says unknown. I wonder uh- Mel, I would just need the link. I don't know if you're sharing your Sierra or Sarah. Thank you. There you go. Sorry. No, thank you so much. And so in the culture of interdependence, we got it done. Oh, I guess you can't hit mute. <laughs> I think I think um, it's it's not letting you mute yourself. And st- oh, you might just have to hit the share sound button when you hit sh- when you when you okay. uh, yeah, if you unshare, okay, and then click the little button in the corner. I always forget about that one. Oh yeah, I don't think I've ever had to it's do that. Tricky. Mm-hmm. Should be able to mute. That was not. The, I I forgot about that part. Yeah, our house is chaos. <laughs> what comes to mind? It's very hard to access health healthcare. I think it's hard in general. I think our system is broken um, for pretty much everyone. But the amount of additional layers that come when you have, you know, and and, in a way, any type of disability, just it it makes it truly a monumental problem. When you think about your experience trying to access healthcare, what comes to mind? Um, This is going to be kind of a bummer of a conversation. So here's a content warning because I don't have a whole lot of really great healthcare experiences. I have medical PTSD. So when I think of the healthcare experiences that I've had, a lot of them have been very challenging, particularly from communications perspectives, trying to make myself understood to the doctor and being understood. What comes to mind is, is a doctor or a physician or the nurse, you know, uh, willing to uh, understand that this individual is different than all the others and how can he or she adapt to that individual needs? But with me, it's more about, you know, will this doctor, nurse, physician, accept me for 
who I am, not what I am. Obviously been autistic my whole life, but I didn't know I was autistic. So I didn't ever knew what the challenge was. And I think about myself even as like a little child and someone had to put attention on me or um, had to touch me in any way. Um, I think I had a real fear response that I'm just starting to really start recognizing. Um, and I didn't always felt like I was asked permission. And that I realized in retrospect is huge. Um, so I kind of didn't access healthcare or access that very, very minimally. Even in emergency rooms, like not being able to tolerate the environment and being, you know, potentially written down as an uncooperative patient because I had to leave before they were done with their stuff because I just couldn't tolerate it. What are some challenges that you've faced in accessing healthcare? The challenges that I face accessing healthcare is the accessibility formats, documentations that they give you, new patients or existing patients, you know, forms that you have to fill out per meeting or pre-form meetings when you get there for your doctor appointment that day, which is, you know, it's not accessible. It's, it was very anxiety producing for me. Um, the thing I think is like what I've recognized, even in like a basic wellness exam, there wasn't a connection. I didn't have a connection to my body and I didn't have a connection to understanding why the question was being asked. So if I went to a wellness exam and they're like, tell me about your teeth. And I would just be like, I don't know. I don't know how. And I, because I'd be so anxious, I don't think I had access like to my fully functioning, like speaking, um, I just wouldn't know what to say. Nobody believes you. And then there are different levels of that in, you know, well, you look at it wrong or you couldn't possibly know yourself because you're this subgroup or that subgroup. And then there are the ones where, well, they, everybody looks fine. So it has to be fine. And I found that a lot as a parent that I would know something was wrong, but my kids didn't look disabled. No, they looked cute and perfect and just the right amount of chubby. But no, no, I'm just one of those moms. Yes, the difficulty healthcare system for me was the physicians of trying to understand my complexity of my learning knowledge and how I learn and how can they adapt to my learning. For me, it's more about, you know, not only speaking to them on that same level, which is very, very tricky, but also complexity of the healthcare system in, in itself because they're running on the medical terminology of, of the healthcare college insight. And when they use those uh, or explain those to patients, sometimes patients like myself with disabilities uh, cannot get it because it's, you know, it's like you're teaching a seminar at a university, but you're doing it with a patient. Well, she has staring spells. Well, she can walk a straight line and touch her nose, so there couldn't possibly be any neurological difficulties. And, you know, it's, it's coming from otherwise knowledgeable people. you start to wonder where is the problem? I have spent a lot of time not getting a lot of things. And part of it was, well, maybe this is just something I'm not, maybe I am wrong. You know, maybe there's this big cosmic thing that 95% of the populace gets and I don't get because I'm me and I don't get it. And I didn't know why I didn't get it then, but I just knew I didn't get it. Right. But no, it wasn't me this time. And a lot of different symptoms show up in the different systems of the body that were fundamentally neurologically related. Long COVID, you know, 
and other, you know, uh, medical issues like asthma. Uh, it's, you know, it's very common, but it's also things that should never be ignored in the medical profession field because those could complicate, you know, the lifespan of an autistic adult or a child. Even though I talked with them about the other symptoms of the autism, my symptoms were brushed off as PTSD. And I can just feel when I walk in, I don't know if it's a safe space for me. And I know, I don't know that it's like a safe space for me, like uh, being neurodivergent, but I also don't know if it's a safe space because of the way that I'm gonna be treated and, and disregarded in terms of like, just go lose weight. I'm terrified to go. I, I think there's a lot of assumptions being a fat person. And um, so like, if I go get my um, blood pressure checked or something like that, there's this like quality of, oh, I can't believe that you have normal blood pressure. Like the, just like the things that people are saying to me, you know, I just recently had a routine mammogram and like what was said to me during that appointment was incredibly inappropriate. When I came to Vermont and, you know, I moved here, so you had to get a new medical home. This old country doctor, nice man otherwise, took a look at me, weighed me, and signed me up for like the entire list of every health test you could possibly have. And I'm like, I don't really want to pay for all these, but okay. And then I was like, no, we don't need to do the cholesterol. At least I know that one is fine because I'd had it done recently and I inherited low cholesterol from my dad. And he wouldn't believe me. So we ran the test. And my cholesterol actually had gone up. And I said, well, should we worry? Because it's gone up six points in a year. That's the most it's ever gone up. And he told me to be quiet. And I was like, okay. And I, I couldn't really voice anything back for me because we're trained not to do that. Well, how is your menstrual cycle? And I was like, fine, great. Well, when was your last cycle or whatever? And it was like, I have no idea. And I immediately like was yelled at. Um, and what they said to me was, uh, it's my, I think of, and I started crying. And they said to me that it's my job. Like, I always think it's a good sign when people are crying because it's my job to make sure. And if I have to yell at people to make sure that they're taking care of their health. Going through that time period was super frustrating, trying to like yeah. get attention and going to like all these different specialists and not getting a whole lot of answers. So many of these experiences are me advocating for what I need, it took me five years to get a diagnosis for my autism. My healthcare provider said, well, we can't say you're autistic or like, you know, like my chiropractic care was like, um, no, there's just no way. Like, just like not asking me, not, not, um, curious at all. Like not saying why, what makes you think that you're autistic or how could we find you an autistic specialist to figure out or to give you some idea how powerful it was. Number one, learning that I was with learning that I was autistic was like a kaleidoscope coming into focus for my entire life that made everything make sense. And I was also diabetic at the time. My blood sugars literally dropped 20 points overnight and stayed down with the self-diagnosis of autism. I, I find that hypocrisy bothers me a great deal in general. And, you know, we're supposedly, you know, a society where we're supposed to take care of ourselves and be informed and make decisions and be self-actualized and everything. And even if you're all those things, and in many ways, if you are those things, healthcare isn't designed to work for you. You know, it's sort of designed for you show up and they send you places and put you in little cubbies and folders. And if you actually are like, no, uh, this, that, that doesn't actually affect me. This over here affects me. 
nobody quite knows what to do with you. Doctors, I don't think, are really taught how to work with patients who don't fit the the expectations of you know what the profile is they're trained to make decisions in a very specific way they need to in order to be really good with their time because um, nobody else lives in your body but you right right so you would think after a certain amount of time you would become an expert in it yeah i mean that's kind of how i look at mine yeah thanks knowing that just because somebody shows up in front of you and may appear normalish enough but there needs to be given some amount of space or grace to allow for the fact that maybe this person has other things going on that you don't know about i try very hard to communicate but then when i get frustrated i become very blunt and the new doctor i have he at least can deal with that mm -hmm. but a lot of people in healthcare are still sort of trained in that, you know, I am in charge and you are here at my whim sort of thing. And, you know, we must be respectful. There's so many different layers of those nuances that I'm like, no, I had to wait 45 minutes for you. I could never go back. So in that one moment, and I like, I went to therapy and like, we had, we're starting to get all these strategies of how do I go back? And that's when I found ABB. I would really, I would, basically I was going through another round of low mood and, and fatigue and sort of growing hopelessness about the possibility of having a future. And um, I had exhaust, pretty much exhausted mainstream healthcare options, or at least the mainstream healthcare options I was willing to try. Um, mm -hmm. And I uh, heard this, I was sitting with this friend um with over coffee who was the director of the vermont disability council and she was raving about this new doctor in montpelier who was out as autistic and starting a medical practice so um what do you wish healthcare providers knew about neurodiversity and neurodivergence it's really like i want them to know about abb i want them to know what mel has figured out i want them to know um this connection between all of the things um, that I wasn't waking up in the middle of the night with panic attacks. I was waking up because I wasn't breathing because I needed a sleep study. I was waking up because I have dysautonomia because my autonomic nervous system doesn't work correctly. Everyone was putting this on me that like my thoughts were causing these panic attacks. Like, I don't know who has panic attacks. I wasn't having a thought in the middle of the night. And the, the way in which Mel has reframed that it's my fault that I'm not doing something correctly, that I'm broken, which is, I feel like what the healthcare would say, like, you're not doing enough. And what I hear Mel saying is, no, the medical system isn't doing enough for you. And so that's what I would love to say is that if the medical care system didn't blame people who have um, difference, uh, that instead was curious about that. And we have made some, not enough, but some progress over the last 40 years, learning to accept people a little bit, to give people a little bit more grace, a little bit more space to be themselves when we can tell they need it. But if you look like you should fit, and then you don't, people get cranky and if the cranky people are the people that we're relying on to give us the referral to actually listen to think about what we're saying and try and put the pieces together in the areas that we aren't knowledge about because nobody can know all of this stuff mm -hmm. and if they're just grumpy because we don't fit what they think? No. For me, I see that, you know, process of the healthcare industry is starting to come around and understand neurodivergent 
neurodivergent individuals and neurodiversity. Having curiosity around my experience, like asking me, do I understand where the question is coming from? Providing a space that I can feel comfortable in and safe in, um, helping me make connections back to myself, not making presumptions about my body, but asking me if like that makes sense. Finding ABV is just like, you know, I've said this to Mel, I've said this to a lot of other people, but it's like, I just know I'm gonna live longer. I can't imagine being yelled at. I can't imagine like not being cared for. I think the whole first wellness visit that I had with Sierra, I think I bawled the entire, like I just remember like my shirt being all wet because I was just couldn't believe the care that I was getting. And I couldn't believe the, the access and I didn't even know what I needed. I had zero idea. and. The, and th that there was all these different options and um so it's just so radically different for me the idea that we can just say this is my access need and if we can take that step to say okay we're going to actually look at this problem what is the actual problem with access what is the actual problem with communication? What is the actual problem with coverage? Oh, then maybe we can fix some of this shit. So, I think that's what we need. What I want providers to do across Vermont statewide is to understand the individual needs. If we can understand your needs, we need to be res respected in the same way. And for me, it's more about, you know, having that, you know, re having that work individual participant relationship. Basically, you want the doctor to know, get to know you better, vice versa, the patient should get to know the doctor better. What helps move things along quicker and make the process more easy for both parties, the doctor, the nurse, and the physician at large. Plus, the individual patient would get, would feel at ease, you know, of, you know, coming back to those services. So, um, I, I did the intake, which invited me, and, and then um, that invited me to share, like, among other things, what I care about, um, and also, also offered to have a provider spend time discussing things I cared about, which really, which really impressed me and and um among other things like the like the like the possibility of sort of like how do you structure the, an appointment in a way that it's comfortable to you and you feel comfortable and i thought and i you know things i had never thought about is even possibilities of sitting in a doctor's chair you know chair with you know a comfortable blanket or you know pillows or you know something like that you know so that that was like oh i could you know and, and so that it was just nice that people thought about things like that mm -hmm. um and then i was sitting um when i was sitting in the waiting room for my first appointment there was this um a short a really short book written for kids and it basically told my life story of losing it i mean i remember reading it waiting for my first appointment so sort of losing it and having these public meltdowns that i was so ashamed of mm -hmm. and it explained those things in terms of the flight the fight flight response which i was totally on board with already so and and then there was also something on the wall in the office about polyvagal theory which i was also totally on board with already and thought that, and was impressed that that abb knew about mm -hmm. and was thinking about and I, so at that point i thought wow it looks like these people speak my language and what i want to see for it is you know that sense of belonging within the healthcare field industry but also understand everybody's access needs is different we're all different we're not the same and uh for me it's more about trying to connect have that universal connection between each industry or each systems and try to make it a collaborative system where it's cost effective and more efficient because everybody wins that way and it's more collective.
than having these barriers or what you call silos that are preventing us from providing those services in the first place. And then, uh, and then this is uh, like a, a sincere attempt, a really sincere attempt, the most sincerest attempt I've ever seen in a medical practice to meet people where they are at, to serve everybody well and to leave nobody behind. Um, it's, you know, it's an incredible effort to make groups and meetings and medical care accessible and, and interpersonally, practically, financially. Um, there's the, 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 and I love that the practice is, is really developed in consultation with pa patients and like we're in these advisory groups and, and, um, and invited to join them and, 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 the, and, and that, and that, that, that what happens in the practice after that is in, in for how the practice develops is informed and driven by what we say in those meetings and basically informed and driven by patient needs. I just didn't know um, that I would make it. And so when I say like, I know I'll live a longer life, it's not only do I live a longer life because I have the health care, but now I have community and making friends. I feel understood. I feel like um, all of the all of the things that seem so isolated in the issues with my health are now under understood with very simple medications, you know, like, you know, it's like it just changed my relationship to being able to get up in the morning, like, like limited my limbic response so that I actually can be here right now speaking to you. All of these things that ABB are providing for me. Um, and then it's like the, the other patients are just, I learned so much. This, this is just like so amazing to me. There, there are these amazing group medical visits where um, Mel and Sierra offer this cutting edge information. And, but they and they also allow lots of time for questions and in depth discussion around areas uh, that the areas that concern us. And there's and beyond that, you know, and 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 there's more because there's also an opportunity to meet others in the community who are going through the same or similar things, um, which then gives you know, us the opportunity to learn from each other's experiences and to really value and feel valued by each other and feel a lot less alone and a lot more hopeful. Wow. So, I mean, the first thing I just wanna say is to thank our panelists Sarah, Matthew, Amy, Linda, Zef. Um, as Sarah said in the chat, you know, we so we are so grateful that you were willing to make yourselves vulnerable and share your experiences so authentically. Um, and I think like the power, the power of your stories, and like there's like a million me too's in the chat. Um, it's like all the people who think they're the only ones. So when we think about access needs, there's so much here. So first off, if folks are not, I mean, like most of us didn't grow up thinking through a lens of access needs. I'm like, what, do, what are my access needs in a given situation? You just show up and you're powered over and you're dysregulated, you don't have full access to your cortex. And even if you did, you, you don't know what you're allowed to ask for. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, in our medical practice, we focus on universal design principles where we're trying to offer things in multiple different ways um, and, and giving people freedom and choice to pick what works for them because I, and I think Amy actually said this in their remarks that like, you don't know what to ask for. Neat. 
Hi. Um, one thing I've been thinking about with access needs and expressing my access needs, well, first off, I don't know what they are. I don't know what I need. That really resonated when Sarah said that. I, I really don't know what I need. And then I'm thinking in situations where my access needs are not being met, my nervous system amps up. Uh, the stress response. Um, my my response is flight. I, I, I run away. And that response triggers, it turns off the Broca center in the brain, which is the language center. So when I'm overwhelmed, I actually physiologically cannot speak. And I think others probably experience this as well. So to express my access needs in the moment is near on impossible. I've made a couple of cue cards. I've laminated a couple of cue cards that I share with people. I practice with people who are safe, who I feel comfortable and safe with, that I can say I don't need a whole lot of context when I say no to them or when I express my content, my access needs. So even if I don't need to, even if my access needs are being fully met and acknowledged in a situation, I still express them with those people because it helps me to tone my nervous system. It helps me to practice so that when I'm in situations where I'm overwhelmed, my brain goes, oh, wait a minute, I've been here before. I remember I did this. Let's give it a try again. And so I'm slowly, I feel in this whole autistic experience of mine, I feel like a fern. I feel like I'm unfurling. I feel like I've been clenched really tightly for about 57 years. And I'm just starting to unfurl. And I'm really kind of, well, I'm terrified. But I'm also really very excited and hopeful to see what blossoms, what this next phase of my life could be now that I have this new knowledge and understanding of who I am. Thanks. That was a lot. That was amazing. And uh, a fern, um, uh, many people think the fern is a symbol of endurance. Um, and uh, to extend that metaphor, you know, so anyway, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and I, and, and I think you're, modeling, practicing this lens and this framework around safe people when you have access to your cortex, including the ability to communicate intentionally. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. And there's lots of, lots of support in the chat for you, Mooney. I don't want to take up too much space because I was already on the video so much tonight, but I just want to say that watching that, because I haven't seen that in so long, um, it's like that almost feels like in such a distance past for me that my whole relationship, you know, and my connection with Sierra and Mel and other patients and um, it almost felt like, oh, it's like such a different person now. And, you know, I went through a really hard time this summer that almost felt like past experience I would have had if I didn't have ABB and what maybe like would have taken four years to figure out in the past was like six weeks. I mean, it was just like, and it was just like, I felt like so many people in the, the community rallied around me. And, and so I just, you know, the thing that was ringing in my ear was just like, congratulations, you're autistic. Like, that's like, that's what I received eventually. Like, that's what I got was congratulations, you're autistic, which is, everything I needed to hear because um, I'm really proud to be who I am in, in this community. So thanks for listening and all your comments and everything. Amazing. I just wanted to share something really quickly. Also, hi everyone, I'm Nora. This is my first call. Um, just at the beginning when we were having some technical difficulties, seeing how well everyone like 
cooperated and just like lifted each other up. I don't think I've ever been on a call where there's been tef- technical difficulties and it wasn't like, it didn't feel like there was some kind of vibe of somebody getting blamed for it. That was just so wonderful to see and to be with. It's amazing. And and thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that, Nora. And I think that like one of the other things that really stands out to me Anytime someone notices something that seems so basic, it's humbling, right? Like it's humbling that that stands out. Why does that stand out? Why is it that like most people in many other environments see something else when really it's not that hard? And I think like part of part of what I think is happening here is that we are bringing people together who are I'm like losing the ability to speak. It's like that hour um. Um, People coming together who, like, can reimagine something else, can reimagine a world where the Zoom doesn't work and a team comes together and people jump in and chime in and support one another and figure out how to support and complement one another's access needs, like, that's how it can be. All it, that, that's how it can be. And so it's my it's 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 my hope that the more times we see it and we experience it, then we know what's possible. And then what follows is we come to expect it and demand it everywhere. Laura. I feel like Mel, you've introduced so many of us to that term, the culture of interdependence. And I feel like this community has helped me feel motivated to use that in other areas of my life and to try and like normalize that we all have different needs and that we can support each other instead of blaming each other or feeling bad for what our needs are. And I feel like that's trickled into my family life and my work life in different ways. And I'm just really appreciative for this community for always role modeling to me how to how to be a community amazing thank you reading in the chat michelle says um i think you all have deliberately made ebb and brain club a socially connected community and each of you is part of the community right this is more than a nonprofit organization offering services it's the culture of interdependence everything is connected oh i want to let that sink in yes right it's we're living and breathing it As Amy says, being provided some grace is an access need. It seems to be easier to find around ABB. Thank you, Amy. Erin. Hi, this is my first call. Um, I just, I don't know. I'm kind of blown away by you guys. I, um, I've just never experienced such safety um, in a group especially on zoom (laughs) it's just I don't know I'm quite touched so I just wanted to share that um that it's just really beautiful the way you guys communicate and it's so um it's so nor it should be so normal (laughs) and it should be so like I shouldn't feel so blown away <laughs> if that makes sense. And simultaneously I really am. Um, so I'm just glad I came across you all and um yeah, cool. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm so glad you're here. Um yeah, I think I I 
I think that, I mean, what we did and we're a, you know, we're a new organization or um, we'll be two years old in November. Um, but I think what we just started doing was showing up. We started showing up authentically and being like, Hey, you want to show up authentically? And then people are like, I don't know how to do that, but, um, okay, yeah, I'll try. Um, and, and that's, that's, um, yeah. Um, I, as we wrap up tonight, I think that um, I, again, I really want to thank our panelists for sharing their experiences. And I really appreciate all of you for being part of this discussion. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.